Hi, I'm Dr. Katherine Emmerich, and today we're going to be talking about trauma-informed care and how that relates to our perinatal population. So particularly what we're going to be talking about is psychological trauma. So we're differentiating that from physical trauma, like a broken arm. And with psychological trauma, we're really talking about an event, like one event, a series of events or a set of circumstances that's experienced as physically or emotionally harmful and has lasting adverse effects including in areas of mental, physical, social, emotional, spiritual well-being. So essentially what we're talking about with psychological trauma really is not so much the event itself, but it's really referring to the impact of the event. And in the perinatal population, people can re-experience traumatic symptoms. So re-experience those symptoms of trauma during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. And what's really important to know is that these trauma responses can be reactivated whether or not the trauma was directly related to an experience with pregnancy or birth. So things that can influence the perinatal experience in terms of trauma include prior trauma, such as surviving a natural disaster, a worldwide pandemic, history of ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences, complex trauma, developmental trauma, which describes experiences that people have when overall their environment growing up was not emotionally safe. History of sexual assault, intimate partner violence, veteran status, history of emotional verbal abuse, prior medical trauma, and the list goes on and on. So you can see that the trauma doesn't always have to be particularly related to pregnancy or postpartum in order to get reactivated during this time period. Things that are really likely to be reactivated are also things like reproductive and pregnancy trauma and birth trauma. So those can be things like a traumatic abortion, reproductive coercion, infertility, that's a big one that we see a lot, miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, molar pregnancy, stillbirth, whether someone's had an exposure to surrogacy, adoption, the removal of a child, or pregnancy complications. Then in terms of birth trauma, what you can see are trauma responses related to things like an unplanned C-section, premature labor, emergency procedures, difficulty with anesthesia, like maybe the anesthesia didn't work or they had to be poked several times, a near-death experience of the mom, significant loss of blood or injury, NICU time for the baby, or a functional impairment due to birth injury for either of the dyad, or insufficient explanation of interventions or insufficient support. So you can see that really the um, breadth of experiences that can result in someone experiencing trauma is really varied, and any of those can come up in the um, perinatal and postpartum period. So I want to talk a little bit before we move on about PTSD because we often are associating PTSD with trauma, but a lot of the people who come into our clinics and who see us don't actually carry a diagnosis of PTSD. And ultimately, they may not even meet criteria for a diagnosis of PTSD, and they can still be experiencing trauma symptoms. So the reason that I want to talk about the criteria for PTSD today is because I think it can really give us kind of a guidepost for what we might look for in the people sitting in front of us that might perk up our ears that this person may have experienced trauma. So let's quickly go through the criteria. So the first one is, of course, exposure to a traumatic stressor, either directly or indirectly. The second one is re-experiencing symptoms. So these are the ones we're often really familiar with. Right? Um, intrusive memories, flashbacks, nightmares, things like that. The next couple are the ones that are really useful in thinking about if you have a patient in front of you. So one is avoidance behaviors, right? efforts to avoid any distressing trauma-related stimuli. And this can be a big problem if one of the traumas is related to pregnancy and birth. Another one is cognitive distortions. So this has to do with not being able to remember everything that happened, negative beliefs about yourself and the world, overall lack of feeling safe. In this case, perhaps not feeling safe in, um, in, with medical personnel. 
can also be having a decreased interest in important activities and negative emotional experiences that are really persistent. Then there's also increased arousal. So that's hyper arousal. That can look like being irritable, aggressive, self-destructive, reckless. And it can also be hypervigilance. So constantly on the lookout for something going wrong. And then of course, it has to persist for more than a month and cause uh, functional impairment. But really it's those middle ones that are really useful for us to keep in mind when we have someone sitting in front of us. So how can this look in our patients? So it might look like a difficult patient, quote unquote, right? a patient that no-shows for appointments is really dismissive or irritable. Right? That no-showing for an appointment may be an avoidance strategy, particularly if the trauma is related to pregnancy or childbirth. And that irritability can be related to the hyperarousal. It could also look like a lot of difficulty making decisions, a lot of ambivalence, and difficulty concentrating on information. So this can be both the hyperarousal and also the cognitive changes. It can look like panic attacks, depression, and anxiety. And those are also the cognitive distortions or the cognitive changes that can happen those persistent negative emotional states. And it often looks a lot like avoidance. So not wanting to think about the baby, avoiding naming the baby, not wanting to read pregnancy related literature, not wanting to make a plan, presenting really late for perinatal care. And so when we see some of these signs, it's a really useful cue for us to change the framework that we're seeing this patient from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, right? Something happened that is resulting in these behaviors as a strategy to keep yourself safe in the face of um, experiencing uh, trauma symptoms. And so this is really where trauma-informed care comes in, because we can see there's a really big breadth of experiences that can result in trauma symptoms. There's a whole bunch of symptoms associated with trauma. And so we also know that for most of our patients that are sitting in front of us we can make the assumption that the vast majority of them have experienced some amount of trauma in their life. We can certainly hear a lot of their stories when they're talking with us about how many pregnancies they've had, how many live children they have um, in terms of their obstetric history. But we can also make a pretty good guess that the vast majority of people in front of us have experienced some trauma. And that's where this trauma-informed care comes in. So trauma-informed care is a program, a system that's trauma-informed and essentially is integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices. And really importantly, it seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. So trauma-informed care is a description of care that aims to promote feelings of safety, choice, and control. And these are ways that we avoid re-traumatization. We avoid re-traumatizing these patients that are already in this really vulnerable state during pregnancy. So why is this important? So we have some data on what happens when someone is re-traumatized during pregnancy and childbirth. So we know that they have higher mental health needs, a lower quality of life, that there's an increased risk of substance use, that they can have poor bonding and attachment with their child, they can have uh, termination of subsequent pregnancies. There can be a lot of avoidance of needed care, even in the postpartum period. It can also be an adverse childhood experience for the infant to have a parent that may be disconnected, numb, not able to um, be warm, not able to bond. And so there are very significant risks associated with re-traumatizing someone. So let's talk about overall, you know, what the principles of trauma-informed care are. So there's kind of five pillars of trauma-informed care, and those are safety, choice, collaboration, trustworthiness, and empowerment. So we're going to talk briefly about what each of those are. So safety is ensuring physical and emotional safety. So in sort of a systems level, this can look like having common areas that are welcoming, having appropriate 
areas of privacy choice is making sure that the individual has as much choice and control as possible so that things are not just happening to their body. And this can look like having clear and appropriate messaging about rights and responsibilities of a patient. So we often do this in all the paperwork that we give to patients when they come to see us initially. The third pillar is collaboration. So that is making decisions with an individual and sharing power so that again, things aren't just happening to someone. So this may be giving enough advance notice about decisions and talking about alternatives with someone. Trustworthiness really has to do with kind of the whole team, right? So it's consistency, task clarity, interpersonal boundaries. So this can look like the whole team really being on the same page um, and also being really clear that this is the person who will do XYZ and this is the person who will do ABC. And I can count on what someone in each role will be doing and I can count on that to be consistent even with shift changes. <clears throat> and then the last pillar is empowerment. So that is prioritizing empowerment, skill building. It's promoting an atmosphere where individuals are going to feel validated and affirmed. And a really big part of that validation and affirmation is not being dismissive. So not sending the message that uh, this isn't a big deal. Uh, why are you so upset? Um, we just calm down, just relax, let birth happen. Those can be things that feel really disempowering to individuals. So let's talk a little bit more about particularly what this can look like in terms of a birth plan or in terms of birth with trauma-informed care. So in terms of safety, those might be things like figuring out who can examine the patient, who's in the room, um, are there a bunch of medical students? Are there residents? Is there going to be a specific OB that will be delivering the baby? Also looking at consent and modesty. Modesty can be particularly something really important when someone has experienced sexual assault, for example. Choice can look like understanding and advocating for the patient's birth preferences. And this is a situation where it may be useful to understand some of the trauma history. So for example, someone who had an experience with a stillbirth, it may be really important for them to be able to hear the baby cry as soon as possible. Or it may look like someone who had a C-section and really struggled with bonding with that baby later to have a clear um, drape so that they can see the baby being pulled out of them and have that emotional connection. So both understanding what's important to the patient and advocating for that. And then with collaboration, making those decisions together, that can look like making sure that you're giving this person opportunity to ask questions, you're discussing interventions before they take place, and you're discussing all of the risks and benefits and alternatives and what are the conse potential consequences of not intervening <clears throat> and you're also giving an appropriate amount of time for this person to make a decision. So not sort of setting up a situation where it's a high pressure decision, if at all possible. In terms of trustworthiness, this is where sort of the system level gets really important. So making sure all clinicians are on the same page to minimize a change in plan and to ensure consistency. And then with empowerment, really highlighting the strengths and focusing on the positive coping skills. And so this can look like um, <clears throat> noticing that someone is advocating for themselves and noticing the ways that they are uh, really coping with the situation that can feel often like it's really out of their control and that out of control things are happening in their body and happening to their body. And it can also look like really listening to this person, really validating their experience. There's really when people start to feel heard, that's a really important part in healing from trauma and avoiding re-traumatization when people feel like their voice is getting heard and that they are important and matter. 
And that's essentially the idea that I want to leave you with, that people start healing the moment that they feel heard. And that is a really big part of uh, what informs trauma-informed care and helps us come up with strategies to avoid re-traumatizing our patients who are in these very vulnerable positions and the vast majority of whom have experienced trauma. So I appreciate you paying attention, listening to this discussion. Here are some references. Please contact us with any further questions. We're always happy to talk more about trauma-informed care. Thank you.